Greetings everyone once again. Welcome to the 198th session of the online Hi. learning series OLS. And for today's session, we have with us Dr. Austin Lifford. Uh, Dr. Lifford is a graduate from the Indiana University and he has also done his postgraduate residency spe specifically in ocular disease. Uh, he has been practicing in an ophthalmology co-management center since uh, he's graduated and done his residency. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and also a diplomat of the Academy in the Glaucoma section. He is the member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and he is also serving at various levels of leadership capacities in these organizations. He enjoys lecturing, teaching and guiding uh, graduates uh, in the subject matter of glaucoma and has also presented at various national uh, local as well as international conferences. Uh, I think the most important point I would say is he enjoys sharing his cases uh, with all of us to his social media platform. And I think if you are not following him on social media, that would be one page which you can spend some time while scrolling your Instagram or any of your social media where he shares a lot of cases, uh, what he sees uh, day in, day out. Uh, currently, he is working at uh, Center for Sight and spends his time more on co-managing with other optometric and ophthalmology colleagues. Uh, today, Dr. Austin has joined us for the second time on our session series, right. and uh, he is going to talk to us about glaucoma and dry eyes, uh, friend me for life. So take it away, Dr. Austin, and uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this uh, Sunday morning for you and evening for most of us today. Welcome. Akud, and thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me back. 198th session. That's amazing. That's right. Congratulations. And what a great initiative you have of helping to us all learn in different areas. So uh, good to be here again. Appreciate everyone joining in. And depending on where you're located in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're out there. So um, as Fakuda mentioned, I'm here in Indiana, six o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> So if I get a little quiet, it's probably because I've fallen asleep again. No, but I'm excited to be here and to join with each of you. And I love the poll, the group of people who are here with us today in different academic retail clinic settings. So hopefully what we talk about today will be helpful for each of us in each of your different settings um, that you're on there. So appreciate the invite. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this again, for Kudin, and to join the online Optron Learning Series. So the title of the lecture is Glaucoma and Dry Eyes and Frenemies for Life. And as I was thinking about this, I'm not sure how frenemies translates in other languages. So there may be something comparable to that, but basically it's a, a, a setting where maybe two people who are friends, <laughs> they like to be together, but the longer they're together, they just aren't very good when they're together. Maybe there's some disagreements or conflicts that come up or uh, challenges that present themselves when they're together. So in English is a term frenemies. And so hopefully that kind of helps translate into your language of the idea of frenemies of settings where there are two situations are together. But the longer they're together, there's more challenges and conflicts within those two uh, settings like that. So and that's kind of how glaucoma and dry eyes is that they are likely to be together. The problem is when they are together, they affect the overall prognosis and uh, treatment for both of them. So that's the title of the topic. Let's see if I can advance forward. And there will be some of you here who might be just be interested in the glaucoma section uh, aspect of this topic, or some of you who might be interested in the dry eye section of this uh, topic area. But my thought is that both of these are similar conditions and that both of them are chronic, progressive, uh, conditions in which they can affect our patient's vision and quality of life. For the top photos with the advanced glaucoma or the bottom photos of the advanced myography, myobomic gland loss, both are conditions which haven't happened overnight, meaning both are conditions which at some point they have either had a delayed diagnosis or insufficient treatment, lack of adherence, minimal education, or combination of all of those. And I think it's our role as providers to make sure that we can identify both conditions 
and treat both conditions because many times they go together. In fact, treating one condition affects the prognosis of the other condition. So both these conditions are uh, similar in a lot of ways for that. I don't have any dis main disclosures. Um, the only disclosure I do have is I wish I'd appreciated this connection between dry eyes and glaucoma much earlier in my career. I wish that it was a setting where I could better distinguish between these two conditions, treat them better, tell the patient their overall quality of life and vision preservation. So all the things I'll share today will be something that might help you as you're uh, in your setting, be more aware of both these conditions and how we can treat them. A little fun fact about where we live here in Indiana. Uh, I live in Carmel, I work in Carmel, Indiana, and Carmel, Indiana, uh, in, in the world, is known for one of the cities with the most roundabouts. So, <laughs> fun fact about Carmel, Indiana. And in fact, we have over 140, I think, roundabouts and growing. I can get to work in uh, about 15 miles away by just going through two stop signs. The rest are roundabouts. So that's where my roundabouts are. I mentioned that because it's an analogy. So you think about glaucoma and dry eyes, and sometimes it's described as an intersection or a connection between those two separate conditions where one proceeds and one stops, the other one goes kind of an orderly fashion. But I think it's more like this, these two conditions, it's more like a roundabout, meaning we're merging in and as we're merging in, other cars are coming in as well. So we have to be mindful of the different uh, flow, flow patterns. And the key to roundabouts is you have to yield to the oncoming traffic and be aware of the potential uh, additional traffic coming your way. Depending on where you live in the world, you may be driving on the left-hand side of the road. Here in America, we drive on the right-hand side of the road. So in America, we're always looking to our left looking for those cars to come and making sure that we're not going to have an accident. And so the key is to making sure we're yielding. So whichever direction it goes, so we're coming in to make sure we're yielding to oncoming traffic. That is a lot like glaucoma and dry eyes, meaning we can be treating the underlying condition. Is this here? Good. We can be treating glaucoma. As we're treating it, we have to be mindful of this dry eye surface component coming our way. Conversely, when we treat more dry eyes, those patients can have also glaucoma. So both these conditions are interrelated. And as you think about on your next roundabout, as you go around roundabout to consider this connection for that. In fact, both conditions are expected to also increase in prevalence and association. So as we think about it, over 80 million people worldwide we'll have glaucoma this year. And similarly, depending on the study, up to 75% of the population have dry eyes, and that's increasing as well. If you're older than 50, in the US, the numbers are about 5 million people have glaucoma. And this is an important fact. I just recommend, recognize this important uh, connection that nearly 60% of patients on topical glaucoma medications have dry eye disease. And I would say it's probably more than that depending on the uh, study population, and probably more than that if we look at it more. So two out of every three, at least, of our glaucoma patients have dry eyes. So why is that important? Well, it affects the quality of life, the tear break of time, the vision, it affects their vision. And I think what's important about it is that in the past, it's been easy to recognize proportion-wise the glaucoma aspect and the dry eyes aspect. And usually we treat both conditions separately. We would treat the glaucoma or we treat the dry eyes. Maybe as we treat the glaucoma, we're ignoring the dry eye aspect in the treatment. But the truth is, as we see this prevalence increasing, there's this zone where we have to make sure we treat both conditions. And by treating both conditions, it actually helps the prognosis for both of them. So I wanted to start the discussion today with uh, two cases that I think are very common in our setting. This first one is a patient who has glaucoma and then the testing shows that there's suggested progression. Having said that, we also have this clinical presentation of dry eyes. So as you look at these slides, what do you see? You'll see that as you look at the eyelashes and the key is to have the patients look down 
you see a lot of this debris build up, even some colorets, this kind of sebrae, almost a demodex blepharitis as well, along the eyelid margin. And the problem with that is, is it clogs the glands, creates this biofilm along the eyelid margin, clogs the glands, increases my woman gland dysfunction, lid thickening, telangiectasia, and ocular rosacea. What that means for the patient then is they have a rapid tear breakup time. So let's see if this will get started for us here. Looks like I'm having trouble doing the video, but basically what I'm going to show you is this is a patient's corneal appearance, and it's similar in both eyes. But if you can see, as you just look at the corneal, the still shot at least, a fair amount of SBK staining pattern. And then as the patient blinked, we had this rapid tear breakup time. So with this rapid tear breakup time, they had to keep blinking to get it clearer. And after a few seconds, it started to break up. So it started a rapid tear breakup time. Uh, significant or moderate uh, SPK. Patient had a lot of dryness and vision fluctuation. Here's a patient's pressures. They haven't been uh, too high. They have average thickness pachymeter readings, moderate, uh, actually been pretty good eye pressure range. We've had a little bit of fluctuation currently on a prostaglandin once a day. Even with that good pressure range, what do you see in these photos? As you know, as we look for glaucoma, the key area is to look at inferior temporal and superior temporal. Look at inferior temporal and superior temporal is where the early areas of glaucoma develop. Glaucoma is preferential rim loss. So look carefully in these areas. As you look at those areas, also fan out, we're looking for any disc hemorrhages. You can see one here. There's maybe a little one up there, a faint one resolving, and one here in the left eye, inferior temporal. Inferior, inferior temporal. It's also a common location of glaucoma disc hemorrhages. So looking in those areas helps detect glaucoma. So this patient, even though they have stable eye pressures, presents with bilateral disc hemorrhages. It correlates with the OCT structural testing, deep focal neural retina rim and neurofibrillar loss, and correlating ganglion cell analysis testing. Fortunately, the visual field doesn't show significant glaucomatous damage. We have some correlating spots here. I think the key here for this patient is we always look at structural tests, the structural analysis first, and see where would we expect to see their structural damage, which correlates with these tests. And as we look at here, where do we expect to see any functional damage? So we have inferior temporal loss. In both eyes, we'd expect to see superior nasal visual field loss. And that correlates. So we have few areas there and a possible few areas there. And this is significant, as you know, with visual field testing, it's such a challenging subjective test for our patients. And it might show some spots that may or not seem specific or significant, but if we correlate with what the structural tests show, we're more likely to find our increased certainty. So these two or three areas here, may not necessarily seem concerning, but when it shows correlating spots, that's a concern for glaucoma development or progression. So here we have a patient with treated glaucoma, suggested a progression based on the clinical appearance. Visual field hasn't shown a significant change. And they have dry eyes. How would you treat this patient? Again, we're treating this patient with a glaucoma. But as we're doing this, so we're starting to see this roundabout this dry eye component coming into it as well. And it's the whole patient. And treatment back here is certainly going to affect the surface up here. So what we do back here to treat the glaucoma can have a negative effect on the ocular surface, which is already compromised. So this patient has um, dry eyes. How would you treat it? And this would be an option where we want to make sure we treat the lid component, the surface, get it healed up. And maybe that would affect which treatment options would consider for this patient. Similarly, let me show you a case of a patient who came in for a dry clinic as we focused up here. But as I examined him, I found this patient also had glaucoma back here. So here's a patient, not as much lid debris buildup. This is a female patient. You can see with a permanent eyeliner. 
Not as much lid debris build up. There's some lid thickening, some gland obstruction, some early tangentasia. And actually, as we do myography, we show significant, we see significant gland loss. You know, for my biography, the glands should look like piano keys or long white columns going up and down. And we have 25 to 30 of these glands. The concern is, though, looks like these glands are getting shorter, narrower, in fact, even missing here in the left eye and here in the right eye. So even though there's not a lot of lid debris built up, there sure is a lot of gland loss, and it's greatest nasally here. These nasal third, the nasal third of these glands, give us about 70% of our tear film. So when we have a lot of structural loss here, that leads to a lot of functional loss up here. So just similarly, how glaucoma has preferential rim loss, infratemporal, supratemporal. Dry eyes also has preferential gland loss. So these are areas to watch for. And if you don't have biography, maybe even using a pen light, put it on the eyelid and highlight those areas for that. So here we have a patient with significant gland loss, ocular surface disease, dryness, and symptoms. As you look at this photo, what do you see? You can see a fair amount of some inferior staining. But also, this is important. It's easier to detect with staining, but this is see this corneal epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. So this corneal dystrophy, as you know, it's a bilateral condition. It's non-inflammatory, non-infectious, but it does affect the surface of the cornea uh, for a couple of reasons. It affects the tear distribution, which then causes more dryness depending on, on the area. Also, when it's central, I guess it can affect their vision. In addition, this patient has low tear lake. So now do we have a cornea with irregular surface, this dystrophy, moderate to rapid tear breakup time, but we also have a low tear lake. So you start thinking in your mind, if this patient came for dry eye evaluation, what would we consider? Then, of course, you want to look at the back part of the eye, making sure there's no glaucomatous damage. And this is a tough one to see, but it's a small nerve. And small nerves would expect smaller cupping. However, you kind of see this there's some vertical elongation. If you look carefully, maybe some inferior temporal rim thinning. It's subtle. And these are those cases that I always worry about missing when it's such a small nerve with a uh, smaller cupping. So these smaller areas, um, this inferior rim loss is suggestive of glaucoma, as we mentioned, look inferior temporal and superior temporal. Those are the hot areas, areas of potential glaucoma damage. So it looks suspicious, we did some tests, and it does show some inferior temporal and superior temporal rim loss. Now this patient has a smaller nerve, so a lot of these measurements are outside the normative data range, and they're also myopic, that's why I have this pattern up here, everything's kind of shifted temporally. So myopic patients have a temporal RNFL pattern shift. That RNFL pattern bundle is more temporal rather than more vertical. So if we shifted everything to your right, this would probably get better, but this area down here still shows that area of glaucomatous damage. More concerning, on 30-2 testing, again, we look for a structural correlation we have significant, moderate to advanced glaucoma damage in the right eye and early to moderate in the left eye. So what would you do? How would you treat a patient with significant gland loss, ocular surface dryness, disease and symptoms, as well as moderate to advanced glaucoma in the left eye? These are challenges because we want to treat the, we need to treat the glaucoma, preserve and prevent uh, preserve their vision, prevent further vision loss. At the same time, we have to treat the ocular surface component as well. And the treatment we do for glaucoma will directly affect the ocular surface. So this might be something you might want to put on more preservative artificial free tears for artificial free tears and preservative topical medications, or consider laser or surgical procedures to minimize the um, ocular surface burden or damage from glaucoma medications. So two cases, as I mentioned, this is a case with ocular surface disease. As we're going around, we also see there's some glaucoma component. They're interconnected. And that's the purpose of this lecture is to figure out what can we do for these patients with these two chronic uh, conditions 
their connection is inseparable, like potentially inseparable, and it's inevitable. They're likely to, to get together. So an overview with the time we have this one, there's four or five S's to consider when you have patients with glaucoma. And as you find, as we find, maybe with increased awareness with ocular surface disease. One option is, is we can stop or separate the therapy. So if a patient has glaucoma, maybe their target eye pressures can be adjusted a little bit higher, um, such that we don't have to use as main medication. So we could stop that. The other idea is we can also um, add some sort of a laser treatment. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So maybe the question is, is the treatment they're on for glaucoma, is it needed? We always want to make sure we don't undertreat, but we also want to make sure we don't overtreat. So the treatment that they're on, is it needed? So one option is to stop the therapy for glaucoma if it's safe to do so. The other idea is to make sure we separate the therapy. So many times for our dry patients who have glaucoma, I'll have them come back to our dry clinic for a separate visit, meaning that we can have more formal dry testing to see if there's any other um, ways we can help maximize their ocular surface treatment while at the same time caring for the glaucoma. So just as we might stop or separate the therapy, also consider separate clinical exams or visits for both those conditions, so you have a, a separate plan, a formal plan for each condition. So one option for these two conditions, stop or separate therapy. Another S to consider is subtraction therapy. So this means that sometimes we may treat a condition by adding more drops or adding more treatment. Sometimes we can actually subtract out some of that therapy and that helps a patient. So if a patient is on two different medications, can we subtract those out and put them into one fixed combination? Or instead of them taking the medicine for glaucoma two times a day, can we switch to a prostaglandin and they're just taking it one time a day? That's just one less hydrocarbon to take, but a lot less preservative-free medication damage to the ocular surface. So what can we do if we can, can't stop the therapy? Can we subtract it? Can we take things away? The other idea is switch therapy. So now they're asked to consider switching. Can we somehow switch this medication to something that might be less toxic or damaging for the corneal surface? So this would be an option where maybe they're on topical therapy. For the first case, as an example, it looks like the condition may be progressing, but we don't want to add more medication because of their underlying dry eyes. So what can we do to that? Maybe we could switch to a laser or surgical procedure. And that takes us to our fourth S, surgical therapy. So maybe if laser isn't sufficient, then we can do some sort of surgery working with your ophthalmologist. And this is an important area here. I think this is something we can even move closer up into our treatment pattern. Sometimes, as I mentioned, we add treatment to lower the eye pressure. But as we do so, we worsen the glaucoma, the ocular surface. This is something we could probably do earlier in our treatment before it even gets to that point. Then do some sort of surgical or laser procedure as first-line therapy especially with um, SLT. And for Kuda, I'd be interested to find out uh, in different parts of the world how well that is utilized, how accessible that is, how that fits into your treatment pattern for SLT. With a recent light study, it showed that SLT treatment is an effective way to help lower the eye pressure, but also not that but improve quality of life is more cost-effective. And those patients who had SLT had less need for surgical intervention later on. So it just gives us better control. And I think SLT, if we look at that in this category here, these two, is sure an option. So that could maybe be a, another S in this area. Switch or surgical SLT considered in this space here. In addition to this, so patients with dry eyes, we have this 4S pattern. Another S we could consider is supplemental therapy. I mean, maybe there's some treatment we could do in addition to their glaucoma that we could actually tr better treat their ocular surface and different types of artificial tears, um, oral medications, or in-office therapy, which would be helpful for treating the ocular surface disease. So consider those five S's. Stop the set therapy if we can. Separate the exams to make it more formal testing. Maybe take away therapy, or if we can switch it, Maybe put SLT in this area or surgical therapy. And in every step along the way, we can always add supplemental therapy. I mean, we're always being mindful of our ocular surface dry eye symptoms in patients. 
Maybe there's things we do for that along the way so we can hopefully help improve this outcome down there. So consider those five or six S, S's as you work with patients who have glaucoma and ocular surface disease. So I think for the main goal for this discussion, as we um, look at it, is my goal is to increase awareness of both these chronic, progressive, unyielding conditions. And to recognize that there's a strong association between these two conditions. These two conditions, they love to be together. And many times they're inseparable, but, and this connection is almost inevitable. If we're going to treat glaucoma with uh, topical therapy, we're going to cause dry eyes. So that connection is, in, is inevitable. These have a lot of similarities. These two conditions have a lot in common as far as diagnosis, treatment approach, patient education, adherence. The challenge is, though, there's this collateral damage between these two chronic, progressive, and unyielding conditions. They're worse when they're together. And both conditions don't happen overnight. They're worse when they're together, meaning that when they are together, it can affect the quality of life more. But also, if a patient has glaucoma and they have dry eyes, not only do their symptoms feel worse, but the testing isn't as reliable, and there are less adherence for their glaucoma medications. So there's value in making sure we treat the underlying ocular surface disease to maximize those. So there's this collateral damage that occurs when they're both together. And the best way to find out how to treat these conditions is there are great research, resources out there. I'd encourage you to look at like the Dry Eye Workshop Ocular Surface Reports. These are a collection of world experts. They get together to talk about dry eyes, and they have an approach of things they recommend. Also, I feel like this is a great resource, the World Glaucoma Association of different books to read. And there's a, if you go to their website, there's consensus statements that talk about different principles for treating glaucoma. Both are helpful for me as we try to consider different approaches for it. So that's kind of a brief introduction, but to show the significance and the importance of these two conditions. And kind of like a roundabout pattern, there's four topics that we could talk about that relate to glaucoma and ocular surface disease. It relates to risk factors that can cause both these to develop, the clinical evaluation, as we look at both these conditions, what things we look for, treatment goals, and patient adherence. So with the time we have, um, is there one that sounds interesting to you? I'm not sure if I'm able to get any feedback that we could focus on. It'd be interesting to the group of what we should focus on. Yeah, sure. I think uh, people can put up their thoughts on the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we just want to see if somebody has any particular interest. We can focus on that, of course. Uh, let's see. But I think the question, uh, Dr. Austin, you are asking about SLT is the selective trabeculectomy yeah. laser therapy. Uh, to my knowledge, I mean, the work I've done with a couple of ophthalmologists, I think it is quite common. Uh, we do have yeah. that uh, privilege if you work with the ophthalmology colleagues. They do a lot of uh, trabeculectomy or TRAB, what it's usually yeah. <laughs> known in this part. Uh, and But most of the time, People do it when mm. the drug delivery treatment fails. I think that's the mindset where they start in with a couple of drugs and then yeah. it fails and then they do it. I mean, that's what I know. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. I think that's kind of been the thought process where we would use it as a maybe more of a last resort before surgery, right. but after we tried all the other medications. And I think the paradigm shift and great studies have shown this that let's do it earlier. Why wait until? after they tried multiple eye drops and the pressures have fluctuated but caused more dryness and made the diseases progress, let's do it earlier, control the disease, minimize those side effects. So I think there's a paradigm shift. And I think if it works, if you have a setting where you can work with your ophthalmologist and do that earlier, and you can show them that data, that that's a good way to help care for the patient, but also care for the disease too. Yeah, that's right. I, th I think related to that for Kudin, if we're at the point where we have to um, Write down on a drop sheet all the different medicines the patient has to take for glaucoma, three or four medications. And you start to see that look come over their face like, I don't know if I can do all these medications. This is a lot to do. We're really doing too many drops. 
So I think those are settings where we should consider doing SLT earlier to get them off one or two drops. And that makes a big difference cost wise, comfort wise, disease control. So yeah. I think there's a way we can uh, change our paradigm shift to help with that. And, and as a nice side benefit, we prevent that ocular surface disease component. Yeah. And also the compliance as well. When the patient has to use one versus four drops, I think the compliance also will help in terms of uh, managing the disease from the patient end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, great point. I, I love this and I appreciate your feedback and the comments there. Looks like there's some interest in treatment goals. I like that. So we all know some risk factors for dry eyes and glaucoma. That's Bakrun, these can be other lectures, and I think we'll do a little shout-out about a future glaucoma course we can talk about. We can cover different things that will be specific to glaucoma. But there's some interest in treatment goals, so let's go there. I think that's a great idea. I appreciate your, yeah. your feedback. So treatment goals, and I mentioned these two conditions have a lot of similarities. Um, whether we're talking about dry eyes or glaucoma, there's home therapy, there's in-office therapy. And for treatment for, for dry eyes, we're trying to improve the osmolarity. That's the number we're looking for. Remember, with patients with dry eyes, they have the hyperosmolic tears, they're more dry, more salty. We want to try to minimize the things they have to do at home so we can get the best results. And this is a key area I think is helpful for Kudin and, and to each of you. I like this idea that um, developing, it's, it's called adherence independent ILP reduction. So if we can take as much of the uh, adherence factor away from the patient, the better. And this might goes along to do an SLT. If we can do more in-office treatment versus home therapy, that helps improve the eye, the eye pressure reduction, but also helps uh, control the disease. So these are some treatment goals to consider. So for dry eyes, what do you think our treatment goals are for dry eyes? Well, one we want to improve that quality of life with um, patients with dry eyes, it affects everything they do. They're reading, watching TV, their computer work, they're driving. Sometimes it's just so severe, their eyes are so dry, it's sensitive to light, limits their social interaction. So we're trying to improve that quality of life. Clinically, we're trying to improve that homeostasis, the osmolarity, get things back down to normal, for the tear quality, but also get the surface restored. Treatment goal for glaucoma is we want to preserve visual function. That's our big picture. How can we preserve visual function? The way we do that, Many times it's decreasing eye pressure. That's our main modifiable risk factor. There's other ones out there, but this is our main one. So we want to improve these two conditions. These are our general goals. Having said that, and this is helpful, I mentioned earlier some of those resources. Here's some quotes, some principles that talk about treating dry eyes, and just some things highlight that it's complicated. When you treat patients with dry eyes, it can be challenging. It's a multifactorial condition. And we're just trying to restore that homeostasis, break this vicious cycle of dryness and inflammation. This is important, brought me a lot of comfort actually when I read it, that the treatment of dry, dry eye disease remains something of an art. And I'm grateful for that because each patient's different. It's hard to know how to do and treat each patient depending on their multifactorial causes like that. So we just exercise our best clinical skills, we judge their significance, and make our best decisions with that. So if we have these treatment goals, these are for each condition, these are treatment principles. Remember our goals, and it is something of an art. Similar to glaucoma, we want to treat when treatment is indicated to help prevent visual field loss or vision-related uh, impair functional impairment. It's indicated when the benefits outweigh the risks. And we're taking all the different accounts, including the presence of coexisting ocular surface disease conditions. Basically, we're looking at the age of the patient, the stage of the disease, and any other factors that could affect the treatment approach. And these should include, as we treatment, set a target pressure reading, consider their eye pressure, their visual function, how, they, how the optic nerve look, and really how will it affect their quality of life. And I can, we can all prescribe a lot of different medications, get the pressures as low as we want, but if it's going to affect their quality of life, their ocular surface disease, we may be over-treating. I like this because it's a balance. Uh, we want to make sure we don't over-treat. We don't want to under-treat as well. And our choice of treatment depends on effects of prognosis. So let me talk about those two conditions a little bit more separately uh, related to that. In the dry workshop, there are some steps, some algorithms, flow patterns. And you can 
search this on your own, but it shows basically the two main types of dry eyes. There's evaporative dry eyes, or there's aqueous deficient dry eyes. And based on your different tests, you know, the questions, your clinical evaluation, you'll find out which condition they have. And then there's different steps along this pathway, along this spectrum. And that's what it shows here. So really we have a nice stepwise approach to treating dry eyes from, this, uh, from the dry workshop. So if you can follow these different steps, it's helpful for us. And we have a modified version of this in our office that we've kind of added to and made it a little more patient friendly, but some patients would come in and they're at step one, we can just treat this phase. Sometimes their eyes are so dry, they're down here, and we kind of have to start down here. And we tell the patient, you've tried all these other things, here's where we're at. Sometimes after we improve this area down here, we can use these as continuous therapy. So these phases are interconnected, but it's, nice, it's a nice stepwise approach, I think, for the provider and the patient. And to us, we, we give the patient this, this handout here, more in patient-friendly terms, to show them what options are still out there just so they have some education and encouragement. So as we do the evaluation, we're looking for this uh, first look at the eyelids. We looked at the eyelashes earlier. This is important to make sure this eyelid margin is clean. And you can use a simple debrider and clean all that off. Just remove that biofilm can help improve the tear quality. So we're thinking, what things can we do in the office? What in-office therapy can we do to help maximize and, uh, and, and meet our treatment goals? I think it's important. It's not that biofilm, but look at these eyelashes. This debris buildup, you know, the lashes are doing their job, but there's this debris buildup. So we want to make sure we can remove that so it's healthier. When things are clean, they just work better. So here's the before picture. Here's an after picture. And this is a procedure called microblepharoexfoliation, or MBE. Basically, the lid hygienist uses a soft high-speed brush and brushes along the eyelid margin on the top lid and the bottom of my lid, and then we get results like this. So it looks nice and clean for the patient. And they notice a the difference. When after they leave, their eyes, eyelids feel better. And when they feel better, they just work better. So this is something we do in the office that would help improve the dryness. We'll still have them do some eyelid hygiene cleaning at home. Um, but with that, these are things that we can get it clean off first. It just kind of sets, sets a, the bar for improvement for them. And afterwards, the other thing we can do is in office therapy, this is called IPL. And it's an intense pulse light therapy, which many times we follow up with. So this is light therapy that targets the blood vessels along the abnormal blood vessels along the eyelid, the transectasia, shrinks it down, reduces inflammation. We also follow them with a red light mask therapy or photobiomodulation. In both conditions, both conditions help improve that biofilm. They remove the biofilm um, after it's cleaned off. And it helps heat up the glands, heats up the oil, so they come out better. This is in-office therapy we can do for the patient that treats the underlying dryness. Here's some quick slides, kind of a busy slide of what things IPL does. Basically, it's going to increase, decrease that demodex load, the bacterial load. It's antimicrobic, increases the quality of the amoebum, decreases inflammation. Here's another slide of what IPL does. It minimizes the inflammation, decreases the blood vessels, makes the amoeba more fluid prevents that epithelial turnover. This idea of photobiomodulation, we're using light to modify the tissue. And then IPL has this antimicrobic, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant effect. So IPL certainly has a role as something we can do in the office for my booming gland dysfunction. And let me show you some pictures of this, um, of this procedure and how it works. So as you look at the eyelid margin with expression, you can see some oils coming out, but it's pretty thick. A little more turbid. Got some good oil expression there, some there, but maybe not so much down there in the right eye. Left lower lid. I got some expression, but it's more thick. Maybe expression of the ones, which is a little more uh, toothpaste-like rather than oily-like. You can see a fair amount of this telangiectasia, this ocular rosacea, and that inflammation on a microscopic level inflames the glands, so the glands just don't, don't work as well. 
as a result, the oils don't come out as well. So we did IPL in office for the patient. We want to treat this underlying dryness. And after four sessions, we usually space them every couple of weeks. Here's the results. Pushed on the eyelids, oils came out better, clearer, easier. And now we actually got some oils come out here as compared to above. And that's with less uh, inflammation as well. Here's another case, a lot of tangentasia and inflammation. We even have some, unfortunately, some gland loss, a lot of gland, significant gland blockage, IPL. We actually had some oils coming out. So we can restore that healthy, oily component. That gives us better tear quality. Again, something we can do in the office for the patient. Even patients who have very few glands can still benefit from this in-office therapy and have good tear quality. Recruiting, is there something, is this something that's accessible or available in your part of the world? In office procedures like this, like micro bluff exfoliation or uh, IPL? Yeah, yeah I think um, it is gaining more popularity. Uh, IPL, I think, has been, I think, the, I know some centers have started uh, probably a year back and it's gaining more popularity, but a lot of in office dry eye treatments are available and uh, there are centers who do these treatments as well. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And that's great. So I think as a, as I care for bar providers, if we can do as much as we can for the patient in the office, that's one less thing they have to worry about. And that gives us better results. So here's some pictures of these myeloma glands. Um, as I showed you earlier, this is a better looking myeloma gland appearance. This one shows some shortening and some narrowing and some loss. This patient has better gland quality, but look at this low tear lake. So now we're switching from evaporative dry eyes to more aqueous deficient dry eyes. And for these situations where there's low tear lake, conjunctival staining, and maybe better gland quality, home therapy might be acceptable with like a hot compress. But we really want to look at their underlying conditions. What's causing this low tear lake? Different health conditions or medications for those conditions. There's certainly a role for using a steroid immunomodulators. And I sure like using even punctal plugs. Once we control the inflammation, they increase that tear leg. Again, it's something that we can do in the office, but if we can improve that tear quantity, we have uh, better success with their potential dry eye component to it as well. Yep. So the point is mostly punctal plugs for severe dry eyes is done as office therapy. Yeah, that's usually what I'll do it for, even for moderate dry eyes. If they have low tear lake, I'll use punctal plugs. I found it's helpful. I want to make sure I control the inflammation first, but it does help keep the good tears on the eyes longer. That's what I tell the patient. In-office procedure. Great question. Let's see. And sometimes uh, looking at other factors that could cause this dryness. So here's a patient with uh, inferior SPK. Up here looks pretty good. It's much um, more inferiorly. We see it in fearless more due to some sort of exposure, maybe at nighttime. They may not be closing their eyes all the way when they're sleeping. During the daytime, they may not be blinking them all the way. They had good osmolarity, good tear quantity, but they just had this rapid tear breakup time. And another idea is you can use a contact lens, bandage kind of lens, maybe for five to seven days, and it shows some good improvement with that. Protect it. This one had severe SPK. This is when we might want to use Procara to improve like that. And this is a patient, this may have been actually a glaucoma patient, or I've seen several like this where the patients present from a referring doctor with severe SPK because of their chronic dry medication and they're almost neurotrophic. They just doesn't know to heal. So many times we'll safely maybe cut back on some medication, switch to preservative free, or take a drop holiday for five to seven days and we'll do a Procare lens. So usually I do Procare for five days We'll have them to stop the drops temporarily, heal it up, and then get the surface healed. And then we want to keep it healed by adding or switching the message to something that's more preserve-free or SLT or other surgical procedures. So this is a situation where we can do switch therapy for it as well. And as you know, there's a lot of different options for dry eyes. This is one of our uh, picture from our local markets there. Did all the different choices and... This is our, from Relinian Factor. They talked about 56,000 ways to treat glaucoma. So if you look at all the different classes of medications and actually more, now we've had some new ones, 
uh, different ways we can treat it. The key is up to the provider to find what is the best way to treat glaucoma. As we look at glaucoma, the idea is lower is better. So we want to make sure that the pressure stay low enough. And that's in the context of the patient's age, how long they're likely to, uh, to live the residual life expectancy and their stage of the disease. So for older patients, we may be over-treating, depending on their overall health, their expected residual life expectancy there, or we may be under-treating younger patients. So make sure that we treat aggressively. And basically with the treatment principle for glaucoma is really they're at a couple different stages. If these, they may have mild, moderate, severe glaucoma, and two or three things can happen at these different stages. One of them, they can just stay in this stage. So they just kind of cycle through and that's good. If they can stay in that stage, that means our su treatment is sufficient. We only know if our treatment is sufficient by different testing. The other thing that can happen is they can progress to the next stage, meaning our treatment isn't sufficient, their adherence isn't sufficient, and we'll only know that by doing repeat testing. The third thing that can happen is they pass away. So there's those three options. They stay in the condition, they progress, or they pass away. We're trying to uh, control that as long as, long as we can for as long as they need it. And here's the things to consider. In summary, I think it's just important to look at the age of the patient, the stage of the disease, all the different risk factors for it. Um, different risk factors to consider. And just kind of, in general, here's some ideas. If they have ocular hypertension, maybe we want to get the pressure to 21 or below. Mild glaucoma, 18 to below. Moderate glaucoma, 15 advanced 12 or below in general each person is different and the presenting stage and age of the patient determines how aggressive we need to be for that and i think what happens is it's important to make sure we set a target eye pressure range to find out what pressure do we need to keep the, pre the condition from from progressing and each visit we reevaluate that and what happens is we look at the optic nerve evaluation does it look stable to us is there any change in the visual field? What's the effect of the treatment of this, the treatment I'm doing for this patient? How's it affecting the patient and their lifestyle, their whole overall systemic health? So we reevaluate the eye pressure and the target eye pressure range at every visit. And three things can happen. One is if we find that there's progression um, or the patient's health is stable, we might be able to increase the target eye pressure reading. Maybe we can cut back on some of the medications. Or if we find that there is progression, the test shows there's reliable core lane changes, we need to lower the target eye pressure. Ideally, we can just maintain the target eye pressure where everything's stable. So we want to reevaluate the target pressure every time. This is a key, and maybe just let, end with this quote that they found that if patients are more likely to progress when their target eye pressure isn't obtained, which makes sense. So we just want to make sure that at each visit, we assess that target pressure range and try to do as much as we can in the office to help achieve that. And kind of in summary, as we do the treatment, is the treatment the patient's on for glaucoma, is it sufficient to prevent progression? Is it tolerable? Is this something that uh, works for the patient? And if it works, is it something that's sustainable? Will they be able to work in their daily routine, their regimen? Is it affordable? And is it needed? And as we go back to those different options, this helps treat for, for glaucoma, but also as we see these patients with dry eyes to consider these other options for them. And I think for Kudum we'll end there, but basically I just wanted to talk about, actually one more slide, show you this. You'll see in this dry eye workshop reports that there's a, what they call the vicious cycle in dry eyes. There's also a vicious cycle in glaucoma, meaning when we start a patient on eye pressure medication, it lowers their eye pressure. The problem is as we lower the eye pressure, we get good results but we cause this ocular surface disease, which increases inflammation. With increased inflammation, that causes more dryness, the trabecular mushroom doesn't work as well, increased resistance to outflow, so the pressure get higher. As a result, we have to add more eye drops, which further causes unstable um, eye pressure, coma progression, and then surgery. So both conditions have a vicious cycle. And as eye care providers, we're trying to stop that cycle the best we can to those four or five S's and prevent further progression. The science and an art managing glaucoma dry eyes and basically for both conditions, we're trying to download the data. We download the data, we put the pieces together. 
find out from the different tests, the different pieces, we then balance the benefits of treatment versus observation, have a mutualistic agreement with the patient that they understand why we're doing treatment, what they need to do, what we need to do, and then we push start, we go, we act on it. And then it's important just to um, re repeat that cycle, that evaluation and treatment pro progression there. Good. Well, I appreciate your time. Hopefully this is helpful. Uh, my goal is just to increase awareness of the, both these conditions and that we can, by treating both of them, we have better favorable results for both of them. Awesome, great. So uh, thank you, thank you so much. I think Dr. Austin, keep that slide on because as I was mentioning, people who are really interested to know and learn about the cases of glaucoma he shares, I think you can scan the QR code and kind of follow and look onto his uh, social media. That would be really interesting if you are uh, into glaucoma management and basically everything related to glaucoma and dry eyes. Uh, as we learned today, it's interconnected, right? So yeah, that will be really helpful. So thank you so much, everyone. If you thought in one question, which kind of uh, come came in when you were talking about the dry eye part and Somebody did wanted to know that, uh, do you do the dry eye symptomatic questionnaire for all your glaucoma patients? Is that something you do like your speed or the OSDI? And do you prefer any of these questionnaire to be uh, more inclined towards helping in your diagnosis? So probably asking your favorite questionnaire uh, mm -hmm. for dry eye. Do you do that routinely for your patients? Yeah. Yeah, I actually, that's a great question. So most of my time, maybe 60% of my clinic is glaucoma patients. And I do have two dry days. So the other 40%. Many times for these glaucoma patients, I won't do the, I usually use a speed score. Speed score. Uh, just a quick questionnaire, find out what their, their symptoms are. But I won't do that until I, I see them in the dry clinic. But that's a good idea. Maybe do the speed score, whatever your preference of choice is, while they're in the dry, uh, while they're in your glau glaucoma clinic. But usually the pattern I've done so far, and I'm trying to modify it, find the best way, is I'll see the patients in dry in the glaucoma clinic, treat and manage those, always looking for dries. But if I see the more dryness, then I'll ask them to come back for a separate, more formal visit in our dry clinic. At that time is when we do the questionnaire for to help with our assessment and plan. So I haven't done it with our glaucoma patients in that setting. But usually it's when they do the dry evaluation. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think uh, that would be a place where the attendee is asking, maybe it is a place where it's a general clinic and they have, they see, they don't have these probably a specialty day, like how you have, mm -hmm. you know, glaucoma yeah. day four times a week. They might be seeing general patients where this could be incorporated uh, while they are waiting to see their doctors. So that will help you in, the thought process, most likely. Yeah, what a great idea. Do it up for every patient. I mean, yeah. if you can make it a, a quick one, the speed score is what we like about it. It's a quick one, and it's easy for the patient to fill out, and it gives you the provide a lot of good information, and then it increases your awareness of that. Yeah. So I think a lot of times, like any condition, it starts with our history. Correct, yeah. Yeah, Definitely. great question. Yeah. Do, mm -hmm. Is there any specific uh, glaucoma drug that causes maximum effect on the ocular surface? So in your experience, do you find that a particular category or a particular drug is having maximum effect on the ocular surface compared to the others? Uh, yes. <laughs> so unfortunately, they all do a good job. They can do it. They work in different ways to lower the eye pressure, but prostaglandins, that's one of our first line therapy options. Uh, they can increase, you know, inc inflammation along the eyelid margin, increase telangiectasia, they increase the, ocular, the inflammation along the ocular surface. So that can affect the dry eye component. The other um, components like beta blockers and alpha ad adrenic agents, they also decrease tear production. Mm. And then carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they can affect the uh, corneal thickness. And so for patients who have epithelial basement memory dystrophy, that may be worse than it. So each of the conditions that treat eye pressure reduction and treat glaucoma, they can all affect and cause because there are to be more dry. I think it's more commonly, to answer your question, prostaglandins. That's what I use most of, most of the time for first-line therapy. And so those are the ones that really can cause it. So they already have a lot of ocular surface inflammation and telangiectasia. 
those are ones that you'd want to do like IPL with, or maybe um, switch to SLT instead. Maybe in, intracameral injections like Darista, so they don't have to take the medication like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think now when whenever we see a patient who is on glaucoma medication, the most important take home message is always evaluate for dry eyes. That's yeah. the most important. And whoever is on medication on frequent checkups, like, like how uh, you mentioned about, you know, monitoring their IOPs, I think we should also monitor their ocular health and ocular surface for dry eye uh, disease progression and condition. So that's important. Good. And I think just for just trying to remember that vicious cycle that dry eyes and glaucoma both have a vicious cycle and maybe we're adding more medicine because it's more inflamed, but maybe if we cut back on some medicine, pressure will get better. In fact, studies have found that if, if they can reduce inflammation, um, then those patients didn't have to go into surgery, that their pressure just got better. That's right. Yeah. We're, um, we're cycle breakers. We're trying to break that cycle. That's right. And another question which has directly come to me, uh, I think somebody wants to know when is the time you kind of refer it to the ophthalmologist? Is there something which you see in these two conditions where you want to refer them for the SLT? Some key points which I think we should remember in appropriate reference. Yeah, I think the general principle is sooner rather than later would be my thought. So for glaucoma, if you find that there's correlating reliable structural or functional progression, then I'd consider referring on if your current medication isn't working. So the sooner the better. Having said that, if you find that they're taking their medicine, you get this feeling there's good adherence, but the progression, the glaucoma isn't stable, they'd want to, they need some sort of surgery to prevent that. We want to preserve that vision as long as they need it. Or it's good to consider referring on for a surgery if they're taking their medicine, conditions are stable, but their glaucoma is causing a lot of surface dryness. You can say they're good, they're very adherent, they're at the target pressure level. The visual field isn't progressing, for example, but their eyes are so dry. It's affecting their quality of life. So that's another reason to, to refer. So it's good to consider referring if the ocular surface disease is getting worse with, their, mm -hmm. with your treatment or with your treatment, the glaucoma is still getting worse. So both are good to do it and sooner rather than later. Great. Uh, one another, I think this will be the uh, last comment which we take. Uh, somebody tells me that uh, usually when they see glaucoma patients on glaucoma medications, the ophthalmologists most of the time prescribe artificial tears. So are they doing it on purpose or is it something which helps in mo all the patients or should we look for signs only we start putting in artificial tears you know for for patients who have maybe monotherapy like a prostaglandin yeah and um, mild dry eyes preservative free artificial tears might be all they'll need maybe they're in phase one of that dry workshop recommendation and for mild dry eyes if they use preserved free tears three or four times a day that might be enough to buffer any drying effect from the medications still maintain their quality of life while still controlling the glaucoma. Uh, having said that, if, if they have to use multiple glaucoma medications, they might need more than just artificial tears, maybe yeah. some in-office therapy as well, or for your glaucoma medications, make sure they're preservative free. That's right. And I think, uh, thank you for sharing that uh, TFOS used to work and also the Glaucoma Society Work Association work, which which kind of tells us everything about the stage and how to do the management stage by stage and correlate yeah. them and see how they help me, right? Yeah. They're great resources. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Austin. And just before we end, uh, I think you did mention about the glaucoma course. Uh, I'm just going to put that for everyone. Uh, we are kind of uh, in the final phase of launching this course, but uh, since Dr. Austin was here with us today, we kind of wanted to launch this on uh, this event. And today being the, I think the World Glaucoma Week is almost uh, at the end. I know, sadly, uh, isn't it? Sadly, yeah, it was the last <laughs> day yesterday. But nevertheless, we are still uh, just in time, I would say. And we are going to launch this course very soon. Uh, this course will be done by Dr. Austin, and uh, we will be having a lot of inputs from diagnosis, 
uh, management and treatment. And it, we have planned it about 20 hours, right, Dr. Austin, uh, to go yeah. through each particular details about this. And also, uh, it will be supplemented by some recommended learning and reading uh, at your own uh, time and pace. So if you are interested in this course, you can scan the QR code to fill up that preliminary form and we'll get in touch. We have also shared uh, the link of that particular form on the chat. We would be happy to receive any feedback and uh, hopefully we'll be able to start this course in the next couple of weeks once we have the registrations in. So you are the first uh, kind of people to know who are attending today's session. So thank you, Dr. Austin, for taking up the time to, for today's session and also for developing this course as well, which we are going to run in the nearby future. Rakun, thanks for the invite. And boy, thanks again for doing all this great work and what a great resource for all of us. So appreciate it. Good to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so all. Have a great day. Great night. Take care. Take care. Have a good day. So take care. Until then, be safe. And we have session planned over the next couple of weeks. We, until then, take care, be safe, and hope to see you in the next session. Bye-bye.